this behind me is the super awesome standard model diagram. Its goal is to represent the relationships between all the particles of the standard model. I invented it and in this video I'm going to explain how it works. To be perfectly honest, I'm really proud about how it ended up. I think it looks really cool. And if you think so too, and you would like to brandish this scientific artwork, perhaps in a t-shirt or a hoodie or a mug or a sticker or a notebook, you can buy all of those things right now at the Highly Entropic store. The links are in the description and in the pinned comment. Okay, to explain this, first we need to talk about the standard model. This is a summary of everything we've learned so far about what nature is made of and how it works at its most fundamental scales. Hey, but what about gravity? Except for gravity. No one understands gravity. Over the years, many scientists have tried to communicate the information in the standard model visually, and this has resulted in many standard model diagrams. This is probably the most famous one. It is the one used in Wikipedia and it reminds people of the periodic table. And it is great if what you want to communicate are the different properties of the particles, like their mass, spin and electric charge. But the problem is that it tells you nothing about the relationships between these particles. For example, looking at this diagram, you wouldn't know that all of these particles can interact with the W bosons. For that, you could use perhaps this other diagram. It is good, but it looks a little bit messy. And perhaps a better option would be this one, created by Chris Quick. This one is great. It is very exhaustive. It shows you all the possible particles and all the possible interactions. But the problem is that it is three-dimensional. So to really appreciate it, you would need to have it in front of you physically, or maybe have like a 3D model that you can spin around. And I also think it is a little bit overwhelming. And finally, if all you want to communicate is that the Higgs boson exists, you could use this one, I guess. It is my least favorite one. It tells you pretty much nothing other than the names of the particles. But none of these diagrams present the standard model in the way I think about it. Uh, the main difference is electric charge. All of these diagrams use electric charge. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to use hypercharge and isospin. And to understand what that is, we have to talk about interactions. One of the great discoveries of the standard model is that particles interact in different ways depending on their properties. For example, their mass and energy allows them to interact with gravity, while their electric charge allows them to interact with electromagnetism. Hopefully, you are already familiar with these two kinds of interactions, but there are two more that you don't encounter in your everyday lives, but they are still real and important. One of them is color charge, that allows them to interact with a strong force, and this is responsible for keeping the nuclei of atoms together. And the other one is isospin, which allows them to interact with the weak force, and this is responsible for radioactivity. For the three forces we actually understand, these interactions require the exchange of another particle, like a photon. The particles that are exchanged are known as bosons, and the particles doing the exchanging are known as fermions. These names come from Satyendra Bose and Enrico Fermi, because the work they did allowed us to understand the difference between these two kinds of particles. And this gets us to the difference between my diagram and these other diagrams, because electric charge is not who you think it is. Electric charge is in fact a combination of hypercharge and isospin. Look, back when the universe was young and hot, with a life full of dreams ahead of it, there used to be a force known as electroweak, and particles would create electroweak fields with their hypercharges, much like how today they create electric fields with their electric charges. But instead of exchanging photons of light, they would exchange a particle known as B. But it was almost exactly as a photon. But particles also have a property known as isospin, which have two possible values, one half and minus one half, which makes it mathematically similar to spin. And in fact, that's why they have similar names. 
Particles could change their isospin by exchanging bosons with an isospin of 1 or minus 1, and these are known as W1 and W2. But it was also possible to create an isospin field and to interact with this field without changing your isospin by exchanging a boson with an isospin of 0, and this is known as W3. The problem is that all of these interactions require a lot of energy, and as the universe expanded and cooled down, particles just didn't have enough energy to interact in any of these ways anymore. But there was a sort of hack. If a particle interacts with isospin and hypercharge at the same time in a very specific way, for complex reasons I can't explain right now, the required energy drops down to nearly zero. As a result, in our everyday lives, we cannot interact with isospin nor hypercharge individually. We can only interact with both of them at the same time, giving the illusion that they are a single thing. Also, the combination of the hypercharge field and the isospin field gives the appearance of a single field created by a single quantity, which is equal to the isospin plus one half of the hypercharge. And this is what we call electric charge. This process also combined the neutral bosons B and W3, creating the photon, a neutral particle with no mass, only spin and energy. But if you combine B and W3 a different way, you get a particle that does have a lot of mass while still being neutral, and this is the Z boson. Finally, this also affected W1 and W2. They went from being massless to having a lot of mass, and now their isospin looks like electric charge, so we call them W plus and W minus. If you want to learn more about hypercharge and isospin, I recommend you watch this episode by PBS Spacetime. It's really good. Now, we are finally ready to understand the super awesome diagram. And first, let's ignore everything and let's just look at the bottom of the hexagon. We have four particles here. The ones on the left have an isospin of one half, and the ones on the right have an isospin of minus one half. The ones at the top have a hypercharge of one third, and the ones at the bottom have a hypercharge of minus one. The ones at the top are called quarks, because Murray Gelman felt whimsical that day, and the ones at the bottom are called leptons, because it means small in Greek, and whoever named them hated fun. Let's look at leptons first. This is an electron, and this is an electron neutrino. If the neutrino absorbs a W- boson, it will subtract one from its isospin and turn into an electron, which has a lot less mass than the W boson, and so all that extra mass will turn into kinetic energy and make the electron move very, very fast. Remember that E equals mc squared. We represent this process in the diagram with this arrow, because the idea is to show the effect that the boson has on the particle. But if the electron has enough energy, probably because it's moving really fast, it could also emit a W-, transforming all that extra energy into mass, getting rid of one unit of negative isospin and ending up with positive isospin. I know this sounds weird, but hey, the math checks out. This process is like following this arrow in reverse. But another alternative would be for the electron to absorb a W+, gaining one unit of isospin, and that would also result in it becoming a neutrino. Now, let's look at the quarks. When people first discovered isospin, they compared it to regular spin, and so they called isospin one half up and isospin minus one half down, and that's the reason these quarks are called up and down. If they have enough energy, quarks can also change their isospin by exchanging W bosons. But quarks have a property leptons do not, color charge. I already have a video just about the strong force and color charges, but here's the super short version. Color charge comes in three different kinds, red, green, and blue. And they have these names because of an analogy to how light works. 
If you have red, green, and blue light, and you combine them, it will look white. So in a sense, the colors canceled out. And well, if you have quarks with each with one different color charge, their fields will also cancel out. So it's sort of like white. That's the idea behind these names. Quarks interact with the strong force by exchanging bosons that carry color charge, known as gluons. And in fact, this diagram could have like a third dimension, and that third dimension could be color charge, but let's not do that today. What's important is that quarks always attract each other until they form groups with neutral color charge. And this is very similar to how protons and electrons attract each other until they form atoms with neutral electric charge. The difference is that these groups with neutral color charge always have three quarks. If you have two up quarks and one down quark, that's a proton. But if you have two down quarks and one up quark, that's a neutron. And the other combinations are unstable. Protons and neutrons have neutral color charge, but because of complex reasons I can't explain right now, they can still feel the strong force, and this is what keeps them together in the nuclei of atoms. Okay, that was the first level of the hexagon, but don't worry, the other levels are just more of the same. Because for some reason, nature allows for the existence of three versions of each kind of particle. And the only difference is that each one just has more mass than the previous one. We call this the three generations of particles. The heavier version of the up quark is the charm quark, and the heaviest version is the top quark. The heavier version of the down quark is the strange quark, and the heaviest version is the bottom quark. The heavier version of the electron is the muon, and finally, the heaviest version of the electron is the tau. The particles in the second and third generation are all unstable, and after extremely short periods of time, they all break apart into particles of the lower generations. But we have been able to observe them in certain kinds of radiation, or we can force them into existence by smashing particles at extremely high energies but we have never found evidence for any other generations of particles. The electron, muon, and tau also have their corresponding neutrinos. And these neutrinos not only have different masses, but they can also somehow keep track of which is their partner. And if they absorb a W boson, they will transform into that partner and not the other leptons. Most of the time. So what happens is that the probability that a neutrino will transform into the right particle changes cyclically over time, and this cycle is different for each neutrino. And we have measured this, but not as precisely as we would like. Okay, so to summarize up to this point, all the particles in the hexagon are fermions, and they can change their isospin by exchanging W bosons. And quarks can change their color charge by exchanging gluons, but there's nothing like that for the leptons. But particles can also interact without changing any of their properties. Remember the photon? This is by far the most common boson in the universe. It's just light. You are interacting with photons right now. And the reason it is so common is because particles can exchange photons by, by spending very little energy as long as they have electric charge. And for this reason, you could think that maybe neutrinos cannot interact with photons. But remember that the photon is a combination of the neutral bosons of hypercharge and isospin. And the neutrino certainly has isospin. So it should be able to interact with photons through their W3 component. Although we have never observed this to happen. But given everything we know, it should be possible. This also means that the said boson should be able to interact with particles in a very similar way as the photon. This normally doesn't happen because the said boson has a lot of mass, and so creating it requires a lot of energy, but we've been able to force these situations into existence in collision experiments, and we've been able to prove that this is true. And finally, we have the Higgs boson. So, turns out that there's a field all over nature and this field has the shape of a Mexican hat, that's not a joke. And our entire universe is in this part of the hat. And we know that this is true because this is the only thing that fits with some complex equations from quantum field theory. And when particles interact with this field, they gain mass. Uh, but it's also possible for this field to interact with itself. 
And when that happens, that creates a Higgs boson. And I include it in this part of the diagram because it is techni technically possible for particles to interact with each other by exchanging Higgs bosons. Now, such an interaction is astronomically unlikely, and we have no hope of ever detecting it, not even forcing it to happen with our level of technology. But it is technically possible, and that's all the diagram cares about. And that's it. That's the super awesome standard model diagram. All the particles in the vertices of the hexagon are fermions, all the particles inside the hexagon are neutral bosons, all the particles outside the hexagon are non-neutral bosons, and the fermions themselves are arranged by their isospin, hypercharge, and generation. I'm gonna be really honest with you guys. I really like how this diagram turned out. And thanks to the artist Lemok, who you can find in Instagram as dragonkey 27 it turned out beautifully. If you want to brandish this scientific artwork, perhaps in a t-shirt or a sticker or a mug or a hoodie or whatever, you can buy all of those things right now at the Hylian Tropic store. The links are in the description and in the pinned link, and all the profits are split between myself and Lemok, so that we can continue doing more cool stuff like this. Thank you so much for watching, and goodbye.